Three. Twas the night of civil disobedience. And all through the night, not a creature was stirring in Oneonta. In a small dorm room, a student Chelsea was trying to sleep. She tossed and she turned, but sleep would not come. Her mind was racing with the issues of civil disobedience. Socrates' fidelity of law played in her mind, along with Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. But what does this mean, she exclaimed to herself, if only there was someone who could sort this all out. In a flash, a dash, and a loud crash, John Rawls appeared before her. Hello, Chelsea. I'm here to help. Let me see if I can sort this civil disobedience thing out. You see, my dear, civil disobedience is a public, nonviolent, conscientious, yet political act contrary to law, usually done with the aim of bringing about a change in law or policies in government. John Rawls' definition raced into Chelsea's mind. It raced and she asked Mr. Rawls to specify. Well, you see, my dear Chelsea, this is how it goes. In order to fully invoke civil disobedience, one must do so publicly. Civil disobedience cannot be done in secret or covertly. It must be public because those who are in opposition must let their claim be known to the society in which they live. Think of it this way, my dear. Are those who invoke civil disobedience part of a majority? Chelsea thought and said, no. John Rawls, these dissenters are members of a minority within a democratic society. John Rawls smiled. Precisely, my dear. They are the minority. They must voice their opposition publicly to invoke the society's collective sense of justice. The collective sense of justice, asked Chelsea. The sense of justice is void of personal, moral, or religious opinions. The sense of justice is what is that which all free and equal citizens of both the majority and minority share. But John Rawls, Dr. King said that you must purify yourself. You must call upon your own moral compass and make sure that your sense of morality is true. John Rawls smiled. Dr. King had a point. One should be conscientious of his or her morals to guide his or her personal life. But government and political policies are not personal, you see. These all govern everyone. The law is public. Morality is private. By invoking a sense of justice, one invokes something much stronger than just personal morality. John Rawls continued, To explain this idea, let's examine the justifications of civil disobedience. There are two forms of principles, and every, and every citizen in a democratic society has. One is the principle of equal liberty, and the second is the principle of fair equality of opportunity. Let's examine the principle of equal liberty. This principle says that the common status of equal citizenship in a constitutional regime lies at the basis of the political order. What that means is that every citizen is equal in the government. Each citizen is equal to another, and this is unaffected by economic statute, religious affiliation, skin color, or gender, to name a few. The principle of fair equality of opportunity is similar, you see, in that even though not all citizens have the same access to all opportunities, whether they be social or economic, no citizen should be excluded from an opportunity that the majority can enjoy in social, economic, or political realms. Chelsea rose up in bed. I see how they connect! These two principles are a part of the shared sense of justice. These are not private limits, but public rights. And if these principles are violated, then one has a justified right to civilly disobey. Nonviolently, though, John Rawls reminded Chelsea, one must act nonviolently within the civil disobedience because one must maintain a fidelity to the law. Of course, yelled Chelsea. Socrates discussed this. By choosing to live in a given society, that individual has given consent to follow the laws or suffer the consequences. By staying loyal to the state, one is fulfilling his or her obligation to the society. John Rawls smiled. Now you're getting it, Chelsea. If one acts violently, then he or she is endangering the whole society's rule of law. This is not justifiable in a nearly just society. Chelsea said, I think I see. The role of civil disobedience is not to discriminate the government as a whole, but to examine if the constitutional government is acting justly. If the society is functioning in accordance to justice, then the law in question may be upheld or dismantled. Whereas if the government is not acting in accordance with the Constitution and is operating unjustly, then civil disobedience is a legitimate way to remove that governing body. John Rawls, John Rawls smiled and said, my work here is done. And in a flash she was gone and Chelsea went back to sleeping and dreaming of civil disobedience. The end.